Hello, heathens, and welcome to Spinning the Wheel podcast. I'm your host, Megan Angus, and in this episode, we are going to be working with the Letha season slash Lunasa season, Waxing Moon in Libra. Yeah, that's right. We're already getting into Lunasa or Lunasad or Lamas season, as you will see with some of our holy festivals that we have starting this week. Uh, by some counts, this is Lunar Week 22 in some calendars around the planet. You will also see that we have some New Year's this week. So, you know, what is time, right? <laughs> All right, let's go. As an interesting backdrop to this entire week, uh, in one of the eras of ancient Egypt, July 19th was the heliacal rise of the star Sirius. It's approximately July 9th now, depending on where you live. And that has to do with a um, astronomical phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes or the zodiacal precession. And that's not procession, it's precession because... You know, we got to keep things weird in metaphysics, right? Everything's moving backwards in the sky. <laughs> now, also side note, side note to the side note, if you're new to the podcast, I'm the queen of tangents, so <laughs> keep up. But side note, when we say the phrase ancient Egypt, we are talking about a gigantic swath of time. Egypt had, has multiple eras to its existence. Egypt has existed for so long that the precession of the equinoxes, which moves in approximately 2,000 year chunks, actually has to be taken into account when we consider the astronomy and the astrology that ancient Egyptians would have been working with. Their, that civilization has lasted so long that their skies have changed and the things that monuments or, or um, megalithic sites in Egypt pointed to, they sometimes don't point to the fixed star or they don't point to the same point in the sky. TLDR, time makes everything move. <laughs> so when we say ancient Egypt, um, we can mean a lot of different things. But in an era of ancient Egypt, as I said, July 19th marked the heliacal rise of the star Sirius. Why is that a big deal? Well, one, Sirius is basically the brightest star in the sky. But two, and this was much more important to the Egyptians, the fixed star rising was the marker of the start of the Egyptian year because it coincided with the rise of the Nile. And then the Nile would flood its banks and it would flood the entire Nile Delta region, which was what allowed them to have this incredible farming and agricultural scene that was very dope and wicked. Um, and in turn, be able to feed millions and millions of people um, and make sure that they had their beer and their bread and their lotuses, right? So, um, you know, pretty cool. Uh, the Nile does not flood annually any year or every year anymore, excuse me, because of the Answar Dam. I'm probably saying that wrong, but there is a big giant dam that dams the Nile River now um, to create electricity. Ah, progress. So back on track, <laughs> um, Sirius star rising coincided with the ancient uh, rising of the Nile and ultimately flooding of the Nile region. And um, this was pretty cool because uh, this part of the year was and still is the hottest and driest part of the year. So it was this very, you know, miraculous boon of life that suddenly would flood out into the desert, literally. Um, now, at that time, Egyptians had a 360 day year versus our 365 day year that we work with. So this week that we're in right now, now and in ancient times, again, what is time? <laughs> this week was called an intercalculatory week, and it made up for the gap in math versus solar movement. So basically they would have their 360 day year 
And then whenever that year ended, they would kick into this intercalculatory week um, that usually was about five days, but if the math was off, it might be six or seven until basically the fixed star Sirius was seen on the Eastern horizon rising with the sun. And there was like, ah, ta-da, here comes the flood slash. That's a great song by Peter Gabriel. Um, and here comes Sirius. Okay. The new year has started. Let's go. What they did though, during this week, in my opinion, is really, really cool because they celebrated all of their major goddesses and gods being born in this week. So it is a fairly auspicious backdrop for us as we come to the close of Letha season and head into Lunasad or Lunasa or Lamas. All right, this lunar week starts on July 17th with a waxing half moon or quarter moon, depending on your terminology, in Libra at 25 degrees. Okay, we've talked several times in the past uh, podcasts about the waxing half moon and where we are in our metaphor and our stages of working through the lunar cycle, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but I'm going to talk about it again. So if we imagine ourselves as a seed going through a whole growth and blooming and ultimately re receding and then death process and rebirth process. Where are we in that process? The new moon is the seed. The crescent moon is the seed sort of deciding I'm going to bloom. I got to push my way up out of the soil. At the waxing half, the seed has sprouted. It's pushed itself up out of the soil. And now it's got to start to make some decisions and really push up and out of its original conditions. So the waxing half moon or quarter moon um, is a little bit of a time of crisis or it, it can feel like that sometimes. If we're thinking about our astrology in this phase, the moon is square to the sun, right? And we know that squares in astrology can sometimes be difficult. Sometimes they're dynamic, right? <laughs> Whatever BS you need to tell yourself to get through a square. Lunar transits only last a couple of days. It's not that big of a deal. Um, but it's important for us to remember in this, we're like, oh, it's a few days after the new moon. I'm going. And we might be feeling a little resistance in our process. This is why. Because this is the part where it's like the universe is sort of saying to us, do you mean it? Put your back into it. Let's fucking see it. Okay. <laughs> so this moon the waxing half moon in Libra. In my opinion, this is a moon for the rebellion. This is a moon for all of our comrades out there. This is a moon for folks who are willing to speak truth to power, to say the thing that nobody wants to hear. Um, Raven Caldera, who we talk about a lot, um, calls this moon in the book, Moon Phase Astrology, Raven Caldera calls this moon the Black Knight's moon. Um, and just for a little contrast, the new moon in Libra in that book by that author is the White Knight's moon. Now let's get away from all of the black and white. Um, but Black Knight's moon for this, aka we are stepping into the role of the adversary or the thwarter or the one who is willing to garner hatred or ire or resentment by saying the thing that needs to get said, but nobody wants to hear it. It's not always a fun place to be really in that conversation at all, right? On either end, like being the person that's like, I'm going to say this thing and nobody's going to be mad. Everybody's going to be mad about it. Or, you know, somebody's saying this stuff and I don't want to hear it, right? It's a, it's an uncomfortable place no matter what. So on this moon, we might get a little glimpse of what it's like in Saturn's shoes. And don't forget, Saturn exalted in Libra, right? So for me, this moon is really like, what does it feel like when you have to kind of walk through life and, and lay down the heavy truth on somebody, then they're like, Bleh, right? <laughs> so what can this kind of work look like? Part of the tough work we might do on this moon is saying stuff nobody wants to hear, expecting folks to eventually be grateful that we were willing to be the bad guy and to point out the problem, 
realizing folks, in fact, will always be resentful for what you just did or said. <laughs> Wonder if these people are even worth your time. <laughs> Become bitter about the entire process. You know, it's a lot of that, right? Okay. It's only a two and a half day transit, but still, if it feels like a safe space for you, engage in some intellectual arguments, right? Like stand up, say the thing that needs to get said, push back. Somebody's doing some fuck shit business. Somebody's, you know, as the kids say, talking out of the side of their neck and you're like not having it. Maybe today is the day to literally not be having it and to take on being a little bit of a bad guy in the moment and harshing the vibes as it were, right? Just know that when all the dust settles, people still might be mad at you for that thing. Even if the course correction happened and you know, the, the, the situation was changed or healed in some way, people still might look at you as the bad guy, no matter what, right? So if it feels safe and healthy for you, engage in some intellectual arguments and make sure that you spend as much time listening as you do talking. Okay. Very, very important that you are getting the full story from the other side and sort of drawing out their truth and then also speaking your truth. If you are not feeling all of that, and that is totally real, <laughs> I think about 90% of us right now are like, I do not have the capacity within me to engage in that sort of activity. Read intelligent arguments on opposing viewpoints, especially viewpoints opposite your own. Whatever it is, wherever your stance is, you know, kind of define it to yourself and then go find who is making intelligent, really want to stress that word, intelligent arguments from the opposite end of where you stand. Now, I'm not talking about things like fascism because there is no opposite to that. Fascism is just bullshit. Okay. That's all that there is to that. So, <laughs> so we're not talking about those types of things, right? But maybe it's about policy. Maybe, you know, whatever. Maybe it's about religion. Um, maybe it's just about societal structures in general. And you're looking across the, the table at the mutual aid fair at your comrade and you're like, I don't know if I like your methods. Why do you think that this is correct? Make sure that when you ask that question, if you do, listen to their answer, really try to think about it and process it, and then be ready to give your information as well to this person. If they're there to receive it, they might not be, right? We don't want to just waste a bunch of time and energy yelling into a hole. Okay. All of that being said, this is also a great moon for political action and speaking truth to power. This waxing half moon in Libra, in particular Libra connected to the justice card in tarot. This is a great moon for political action, political speeches, making, making our voices heard. So go with that. But that whole vibe about speaking truth to power and dealing with power dynamics and having to say stuff people don't want to hear and all of that kind of stuff. We're going to touch on this theme over and over again this week, interestingly enough. Okay. Uh, while we are working with this waxing moon in Libra for our lunar body, we want to be opening, activating, adorning, and stimulating our hips, our kidneys, and our bladder. Again, as I say every week, not a medical doctor, a doctor of love. Um, and so please get with your trusted health advisor and compare notes before you do anything I have told you to do. For our plant bodies, just like when the moon is in Virgo, when the moon is in Libra, we ain't doing nothing to the plants. Maybe water them a little bit, adjust them, maybe give them a quarter spin so the sunlight is good. Otherwise, we're good to go. Leave them alone. Okay, also on this day, Later in the day, the waxing half moon moves into Scorpio. And we're going to talk about um, doing our lunar Scorpio work for tomorrow, quote unquote, on July 18th. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, just know that the moon has moved into Scorpio because a few hours later, the sun in Cancer opposes Pluto retrograde in Capricorn at 25 degrees. Ugh. Okay, so what's what's up with the sun opposed Pluto? You know, confrontations with power figures, confrontation with authority figures, situations and even objects might literally break down and we will have to stop and repair them. But 
only by airing out all of the funky stuff, clearing out all the broken parts, calling in the fractured pieces, can you possibly clear up the issue. It is time to be honest and super real, even if what you are saying is difficult to hear, even if what you are saying is difficult to say. Let me say that too. Um, this is the way to find the new healthy ground for that relationship. And when I say that, I am not necessarily saying that all relationships need to be repaired and kept in our lives. Sometimes it's about getting to the real and saying out loud to yourself, I can't have you in my life anymore. And that's the healthy ground that we need to be on. We need to like literally not be around each other anymore. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you know what's up with your situations, right? So you know what level reality needs to be happening at. This is one of those astrological moments where the sun and Pluto are both like, yeah, we also know <laughs> about that reality and we're going to reinforce that today. Um, conversely, I also encourage you to try to, um, you know, do not seek to do harm with your words and do not attempt to manipulate a situation, which is something that Pluto really wants to bring in. Um, when Pluto is feeling stifled or funky or, you know, not in its positive, progressive place of power, pa -pa 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 -pa, Pluto, <laughs> um, it gets funky. It acts, it acts wrong. It gets manipulative. It gets authoritarian. It gets very, um, you know, totalitarian. And, and is fine being manipulative. We don't want to engage in that stuff. And the real deal of, on that is it's probably going to backfire on you later when Pluto turns direct in October, which is a time ruled by Libra. <laughs> so it all kind of connects. We're going to see a little bit of that connecty stuff with the astrology this week. So on this day, we have Libra, waxing Libra, and then waxing Scorpio, waxing Libra saying, hey, it's time to speak truth to power. And then also at the same time, we have Sun and Cancer opposed Pluto in retrograde saying, it's time to speak truth to power. And it could be scary. And you got to hold your ground. Just make sure that what you are saying is the actual truth of the situation. And, you know, there you go. All right, July 18th, we have our waxing half slash gibbous moon in Scorpio. Moved in yesterday, but it's, we're really going to talk about it today. Okay, so thinking about all that lunar work asked of us while the moon was in Libra, right, to be the bad guy with the unpopular facts, the unpopular opinions, um, and the political work of speaking truth to power, as the moon moves into Scorpio, this can, if we are not present with our process and listening to what is coming up for us, we can move into a place of wanting to get revenge or to show them or to make them pay. And sometimes, hey, I'm a fire sign. Revenge can, uh, it kind of has its place. I don't know. Energetically, I'm probably not supposed to encourage you towards actions like that. It's probably supposed to be saying, you know, seek a higher goal. You do you, babe. <laughs> if it helps you sleep at night, but does it really? You know, that's the question, right? Okay. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes, right? But Let's be real. Revenge and vengeance and all of that stuff is so energetically taxing. And oftentimes it's kind of a closed loop. So like we're satisfying part of ourselves, but we aren't necessarily making any forward progress. Again, I'm not telling you how to live. You do you, but just be as real as you possibly can when this kind of urge comes up. Be as real as you can with yourself. I encourage you to also consider what other ways a situation could be dealt with other than revenge and to whatever level it's healthy for you to do so i encourage you to look behind the urge for revenge and to see the pain that lies there this could be a really powerful time to go and sit with those funky parts of yourself and with patience and courage allow those parts to speak about their pain 
It is a fantastic moon for therapy of any kind. Do not compare your process to anybody else's. Don't worry about that. Just do you. That's what's up. Okay. While we have our moon in Scorpio, we are working with our lunar body. We are opening, activating, stimulating, and adorning our sex organs and our waste elimination organs. Um, I don't want to necessarily say that they are um, reproductive organs because plenty of us are not making flesh babies with them, but we might be making other babies. <laughs> okay. Uh, great time for adorning. So vajazzling, all very appropriate. All right. Plant bodies. We have uh, planting, transplanting, or grafting for above ground activity. So if you have a plant in the house that needs transplanting and you're really hoping it will pop off and put out some more branches or some more leaves or some more flowers, this is a great time to do that plant or transplant. Side note, we are still in, long, or excuse me, um, Letha season, though these are the final days of Letha season that we are in. Um, and so during all of Letha season, um, harvesting ethically, as I say, ethically harvesting any of the plants that you're going to use for the rest of the year, medicinally, magically, however you're going to use them, this is the most potent time for harvesting plants for that activity. And interestingly enough, when the moon is in Scorpio, all medicinal herbs harvested during a Scorpio moon are extra potent regardless of their purpose. And I encourage gathering them during the waxing moon and then storing them, like leave them out to dry for a bit and then store them during the waning moon, which comes after the full moon, and keep them in the dark. Uh, this year, running from July 18th to July 23rd is um, the Hajj for Islam, for our Muslim friends and comrades and neighbors and lovers. Uh, the Muslim annual pilgrimage known as the Hajj will start July 18th with Eid al-Adha being celebrated on July 20th. The Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam and is a once in a lifetime duty for all able-bodied Muslims to perform if they can afford it. Before the pandemic, about two and a half million pilgrims would descend on Mecca for the five day long festival. This year, only about 60,000 people have been approved because of the worldwide pancake. Um, this year, Hajj falls on the 8th of Dhul al Hijjah. This is the 12th and final month in the Islamic lunar calendar. And the Islamic lunar calendar shifts backwards. 10 to 12 days every year. They have a solar marker calendar, but they really follow very strictly, especially for religious and spiritual observances, the lunar calendar. And they allow it to, they allow their calendar to roll through the years and to follow the lunar cycles. The lunar cycle does not match the solar cycle within a single year. Um, so over time, they kind of move out. So at different times that you'll have Hajj, the, the pilgrimage to Mecca happening through all different times of year. Bummer for folks that have to do it now <laughs> because it's literally the hottest time of year and we're having these insane heat waves. So if you're doing your Hajj this year, drink your water, drink your water, stay hydrated. <laughs> That's a lot of work to be doing in that hot, hot sun. But here is something else that I thought was very interesting because I did a little bit of math. It will take the moon approximately check this out, 33 years for the lunar cycle to repeat itself in respect to the solar calendar. So on the yearly level, no, the moon and sun are not matching up. But on a much larger level, yes, the moon and sun are in fact, they have this synodic thing that's happening between them. And hello, 33? That, I mean, phew, a variety of magical, spiritual, and religious traditions venerate or value the number 33 or 3-3, three, three, like double three. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's no time in this podcast, but there's a lot. Okay. Other things happening on this day. Actually, just one other festival is happening. And it is uh, something that starts on the third Sunday in July, which happens to be July 18th this year. And this is Gala Bayrami from Turkmenistan. This festival celebrates the annual wheat harvest and it is observed on the third Sunday in July. This is often regarded as a professional holiday across the country. Um, and wheat cultivation has played an important role in this region of the world. And really, let's be honest, all around the world for, I don't know, about 10,000 years. Turkmenistan, um, 
was home to a city called Merv, M-E-R-V, which at one time was the largest city in the world. Um, this The Silk Road ran through Turkmenistan, and this was a region of the world that was just literally a global crossroads um, in its era. So this is a harvest festival that sort of celebrates you know, but it reaches back, right? <laughs> it's touching into some things that are really important and would have affected huge, huge groups of people. Okay, July 19, we have our waxing slash gibbous moon entering Sagittarius. So thank you for the heavy vibe, Scorpio. We're going to move on now, though. <laughs> so as the moon moves into Sag, we come out of that heavy Scorpio work into the gibbous Sagittarian moon work, which calls us to study, particularly work from the past. And we can study anything, but we want to be open to whatever information comes to us. The subject matter on this waxing Sag moon, when we're studying, the subject matter is not so important as our attitude about how we are receiving the information. We don't want to be studying to find that one fact that is going to justify our behavior or our stance or support our behaviors or our beliefs. Okay, right? We've just had a few days of some funky bullshit, like having to tell some people some stuff, feeling maybe revengeful or, you know, something along those lines. And now we're moving into this moon and it's like, okay, let me study and but we don't want to just go try to find things that are going to justify what we were doing or what we were saying. We want to just be open to whatever comes to us. We want to follow tangents and just let the information take us where it's going to go. Side note for future reference, this moon is always a great moon for research and academic writing and taking tests. When we are working with our lunar body, we are opening, activating, stimulating, and adorning our thighs and our extended vertebrae, which is our sciatic nerve and all of that stuff. And for plant bodies, we are harvesting, we are pruning, we are doing some pest control, maybe we're weeding, you know, whatever, whatever makes sense for you, whether you're in an apartment with some plants in your house or you've got plants outside your house, now is an appropriate time for all of those activities. What do we have on the astrological front? <laughs> Here we go. The astrology for this day is super fun. Mercury in Cancer square Chiron retrograde in Aries at 12 degrees. Did I mention that Chiron went retrograde in Aries just like a couple days ago? <laughs> it did. So if you're like, why am I like this? It, you can blame Chiron. Driving home to us uh, a mental awareness of our wounds and how we can bring healing to ourselves is really the core of the work that we are doing when Mercury is squaring Chiron. In the healing crisis, quote unquote, that is provided by transiting Mercury squaring Chiron, your mental alertness could be so exacting that you create the reality you desire and heal your wounds so you can return home to yourself. That's Chiron, Mercury, Cancer, Aries. You can make that healing and anything you want become reality solely with the power of your mind. You can actually do magic. If you're having a tough time with this transit, you might feel an urge to center yourself or your pain with other people and in inappropriate situations. But let me tell you, you should be centering yourself though, but with yourself. So as this work comes up for you, if you're like, I'm fussy, I'm not feeling good, take yourself out of the situation. Go put yourself in time out. It's no big deal. There's always going to be another party. There's always going to be another day at the beach. It's no big deal. Um, and if they're really your friends, they're going to support you putting yourself in a healthy place to do the work that you need to do. All right. What are our holy days for July 19th? Let's talk about it. Well, as I mentioned previously, in the ancient world, in the ancient, in and the ancient era, uh, July 19th uh, syncretized with the heliacal rising of the star Sirius. And wouldn't you know it, um, way up in Ireland <laughs> on July 19th and running through August 1st, 
that's Lamas, Lunasa or Lunasad. We have the Anach Teltean. Uh, this is the Feast of Teltu. Um, and this was an ancient holiday and it is still celebrated by modern pagans. These are funeral games. And the games were founded according to the Book of Invasions by Lu Lampada or Lu or Lug. Um, Lu is one of the most prominent gods in Irish mythology. Uh, and this was a mourning ceremony for the death of his fo foster mother, Tailtu. Lu buried Tailtu underneath a mound in an area that took her name and was later called Tailteen in County Meath in Ireland. Uh, the event was held during the last fortnight of July and culminated with the celebration of Lunasad, Lunasa, Lamas, Eve, August 1st. Modern folklore claims that the Taltean games started around 1600 BCE, with some sources claiming as far back as almost 2000 BCE. So these games would be somewhere in the area of 4000 to 3000 ish years old. We're going to talk more about these games and the goddesses and the gods associated with them in the upcoming Lamas Lunasad Lunasa class, which is coming up on July 28th and will be starting at 5 p.m. I might bump it to 6 p.m., but 5 p.m. specific standard time on my YouTube channel. You will be able to see it through my website, www.meganangus.com, or you can go to YouTube, Megan Angus. Um, Find me on Instagram, social media, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, it's listed everywhere. Okay, that's happening on that day. Also on this day, uh, we have the birth of Osiris. Kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, heliacal star rising, Sirius, right? Uh, and, you know, the start of the Egyptian calendar, the calculatory, intercalculatory week, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so... That intercalculatory week that I talked about at the beginning of the podcast is kicking off now here on July 19th in the ancient era. What is time? And it kicks off, it starts with the birth of Osiris. Osiris is the god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, vegetation, the moon, like... Our homeboy Osiris does it all. <laughs> he covers everything. Uh, he was classically depicted as a green-skinned deity with a pharaoh's beard, partially mummy-wrapped at the legs, um, usually wearing a very distinctive atef crown and holding a symbolic crook and flail. He was one of the first to be associated with the mummy wrap. Why? Well, when his brother Set, who we will also talk about, cut him into pieces after killing him, Isis, his wife and sister, because that's how they rolled in the ancient days, uh, found all the pieces, nearly, and wrapped his body up, enabling him to return to life. Osiris can be considered the brother of Isis, Set, Nephthys, and Horus the Elder, who we will also talk about, and the father of Horus the Younger. Osiris was the judge of the dead and the underworld and the agency that granted all life, including sprouting vegetation and the fertile flooding of the Nile River, which we have discussed. He was described as he who is permanently benign and youthful. Hmm, kind of sounds like the Holly King. Huh, interesting. And the Lord of Silence. And that name reminds me of another character that we will talk about in Lunasod season named Crom Dub. Uh, but we're not going to talk about it right now. Um, through the hope of new life after death, Osiris began to be associated with the cycles observed in nature, in particular vegetation and the annual flooding of the Nile through his links with the heliacal rising of the constellation Orion, the great warrior and Sirius at the start of the new year. Osiris was and kind of still is widely worshipped until the decline of ancient Egypt religion during the rise of Christianity. And uh, that's a sentence I'm going to say multiple times this week. Some Egyptologists believe Osiris may have even been a former living ruler. 
possibly a shepherd who lived in pre-dynastic times, and we're talking like 5500 BCE, so, you know, only about 7,000-ish years ago, in the Nile Delta, whose beneficial rule led him to being revered as a god. The accoutrements of the shepherd, the crook and the flail, once insignia of the Delta god Anajeti, with whom Osiris was associated, support this theory. Pretty cool stuff. And this is something that we see in the Greco-Roman world as well, where we have a vegetation deity who is also a death deity. Uh, and that there are um, stories or myths or symbols connected with the deity uh, about death and rebirth or something about resurrection or life after death or something along those lines. So this idea of life, death, rebirth, resurrection, um, and, you know, being a god that oversees the living and the dead, all of this stuff kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? I don't know what that is. But yeah, we see this a lot. <laughs> it's kind of a thing. And Homeboy was doing it, you know, 7,500 years ago. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, as we like to say here on the podcast. Moving on to July 20th. This brings us to the actual gibbous moon in Sagittarius. It will be gibbous at 13 degrees of Sagittarius. And uh, we've already talked about our Sag work. Um, so continue that stuff. Studying, trying not to have a goal, just being interested in the information that's coming to you, kind of going on tangents, but not necessarily acquiring information to further support your dogmatic views. Love you. Respectfully. Hashtag respectfully. Fucking quit it. All right. What is happening in astrology on this day, uh, other than the moon being in Sagittarius? We have Mercury in Cancer, sextile Uranus in Taurus at 14 degrees. Um, this can manifest a bunch of different ways, but mostly it's going to feel like, or may, I should say, feel like a day of new, startling, innovative thinking even in familiar or old places or with familiar or old people or friendships. It's a great day to come back to an old problem that you couldn't figure out in the past or something that you've been working on, but you don't feel like you've been making any progress with it. Uh, our thinking just is a little bit more expanded under this transit and we're sort of open to new ideas. Sits very nicely with that Sagittarius moon situation, doesn't it? Like I'm asking for more information. I'm trying not to be goal oriented, just curious about what's coming to me, running down rabbit holes, doing, letting my brain kind of just run, run amok and have a good time. And here Mercury and Cancer sextile Uranus is like, Hey, new startling, innovative thinking, check it out. Fucking cool. So be open to new ideas, new perspectives and sudden shifts to your schedule. The more flexible you can be about stuff in general, the easier this day is going to flow. <laughs> and the more unusual things will make sense. And it's a short transit. If you're like, I don't like this, I want my schedule. It's only going to last for a day. It'll be fine. Um, and he does, in fact, have a celebration at winter solstice. Again, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <clears throat> All right, moving on to Perun's Day. This is a Slavic holiday that has gone through a bunch of different forms. Um, it's had saint worship added to it and then removed and then added and removed. Um, a lot of the Slavic pagan traditions uh, have come to us relatively intact. Um, some of them have definitely been wiped out. Some of them have been really well canonized in saint worship. So it's kind of cool. Um, Perun is an ancient Slavic deity of thunder and warriors. So here we have a connection to Perun um, with Osiris and with the constellation Orion, which is in the sky at this time of year. Uh, the holiday, which used to be one of the most important events in the Slavic tradition, persists in modern Russia. One of the principal deities in Eastern and Northern Slavic mythology, uh, Perun, um, was or is the chief god, the god of thunder, lightning, rain, ruled the heavens, and later was a god of war. Uh, 
interestingly, on a clay calendar from the Cherniachiv culture of the Kiev region, Perun's day is marked with the sign of thunder, which is a six-spoked wheel. Hello! Do we remember our lessons from the Letha class about spoked wheels? Hmm, interesting. His war th worship has been supplanted or syncretized in some places with Saint Elijah. And you can go do your research on Saint Elijah. There's no time in this podcast for it. Okay, our holy days for July 20th, we have a lot, um, starting with Venikinus, uh, aka the Binding of the Wreaths. This is a folk festival found uh, in Lithuania, and for the longest time, I could only find listings of this festival in modern pagan calendars. And that's not to say that that isn't legitimate, I, I just couldn't find any anything older than a website from 20 years ago, and that was it. Didn't seem like anybody else was talking about this until I found <laughs> a 1957 issue of the magazine called Let's Dance. Hello, David Bowie reference. You always, always follow David Bowie through the magical fog. <laughs> they will lead you to where you need to go. Uh, this was a dancing, a, a magazine dedicated to folk and square dancing, um, past and present. Um, and so this festival was always held in the later part of July and near sunset, the youth of the village or the town uh, would go out to the woods, drape themselves in flowers, and then they would find twin birch trees or lime trees, twine the branches together to make an arch and then pass through the arch singing, bless us, O goddess, youthful swain and maiden, steadfast friends, the two. And then, in theory, those two people are a couple for the rest of the summer or, you know, for as long as they wanted to hang out and knock sacred boots, as we like to say on the podcast here. Side note, tangent, side note, Swain, the word Swain is connected to the word Swithins, which connects to John, ultimately. So this is ultimately a reference to the archetypes that would have been connected to St. John, St. John the Baptist. We talked about St. John the Baptist in um, the Letha class and in a few of the uh, Letha podcasts. And we will talk about St. John again as we move into um, Lunasa season. Um, very important character because this is the counterpart to uh, the Jesus archetype that is celebrated by some folks or appropriated uh, at winter solstice. So this is very much the Holly King sort of rising again and stepping through and saying, hi, I'm here again. All right. What else is happening on this day? We have the birth of Horus the Elder back to our ancient Egyptian week of the gods. Okay. Uh, Horus is also known as Her, Heru, Hor, or Har in ancient Egyptian. And Horus the Elder is one of the most significant ancient Egyptian deities. They served many functions, most notably the god of kingship and the sky. And that's important. Um, his worship started around 3100 BCE. Different forms of Horus are recorded in history, and these are treated as distinct gods by Egyptologists. These various forms may possibly be different manifestations of the same multi-layered deity in which certain attributes or syncretic relationships are emphasized, not necessarily in opposition, but complementary to one another, consistent with how the ancient Egyptians viewed multiple facets of reality. And I would say that that description also fits um, loosely the way that Hindus describe their pantheon, their deities, their gods and goddesses. There's the goddess, and then there's these all these iterations of the goddess. And it's not that they're in conflict with each other, they complement each other. They are different facets of the same gem, is sort of the way that I think of it. Uh, Horus was most often depicted as a falcon, most likely a lanner falcon or a peregrine falcon, or as a man with a falcon head. He is called the son of truth, signifying his role as an important upholder of the goddess Ma'at. His right eye is the sun and his left eye is the moon. July 21, the gibbous moon enters Capricorn. This is a moon where we are moved to seek value in the material, physical world. 
That's not to say only money or only material goods matter on this moon, but instead, after all that emotional and intellectual work that we've been doing over the last few days, we turn that effort to the physical world. On this moon, we think about the work that we do in the physical world, our mastery of that craft, and what is that worth? But what is stimulating this? The tough work that we have done over the last few days. This might seem disconnected, but let me connect it for you. Part of how we develop our values and how we value things like our work or the things that we produce is built out of pain and fear that we learn or experience. We all want to feel security and to know that the community values us and will not turn us out. For some context, on the Cancer Moon in this phase, we might do this work through making sure that everyone loves us. On the Capricorn Moon, we are approaching this work through our work and the value of the product that we are bringing to the community. Real talk? This is a place I struggle pretty hard. I am afraid of being seen as a burden on the group. So I demand of myself, unfairly, that I am always churning out the highest quality product possible as often as possible. Recipe for burnout? You betcha! <laughs> so, <laughs> on this moon, we are doing work for the community. But we're not doing it for free. <laughs> All my gig workers out there, my sex workers, my artists, my performers, this is a great time to think about the true value of your work and adjust your prices if that feels good. Be honest with yourself about your worth and the worth of your product. Think about what you are actually adding to your community. And yes, we also want to be aware of the ways our community can actually support us too. So this isn't just shoot for the moon with your prices, right? We want to be real. We don't want to screw over the people that we are trying to help, that are trying to help us, all that stuff, right? But I do want you to be brave and ask for what you are worth. Perhaps now is a great time to adjust your prices or adjust your offerings, and for steady workers who work for someone else, not for yourself, this might be a great time to ask for more money or less responsibility. And I will leave it up to you to figure out which is right for your situation. And community, pay your people. Let them know that you value them and that they offer a product that you value. Let them know they add value to your community and your village. Maybe you have a favorite DJ who hasn't been able to DJ in public for the last year and a half. Send them $5 through Venmo. Tell them you miss them. Whatever. Just acknowledge the people that are actually doing stuff in your community and making your life better and adding value to your community. And you people, and this is really all of us, we're all in all of these roles, right? All of us are appreciating something and getting, getting something from someone, and all of us are providing something too. So I want you to stand with a foot in both places and value what you have, value what you offer, and also value those people in your community that are making making your community as dope and bomb and wicked and sick and ill as it is. I, I'm old. I use a lot of uh, old terminology. Okay. <laughs> when we have our waxing moon in Capricorn for the lunar body, we are opening, stimulating, activating, and adorning, in particular, our skin that membrane through which the world passes into us, right? So anything for our skin, 
And then also our joints, our bones, and our knees. Our whole skeletal structure is ruled by Capricorn, and in particular the joints, and in particular the knee joints. Um, so anything that is opening, activating, stimulating, or adorning. And for our plant bodies, we are wanting to fix or build fences, garden beds, and really it's just about focusing on the structures, the border, and the supports that your plants are using. So maybe you're only growing indoor plants, you live in an apartment, no big deal. Maybe it's time to just give the plants a, a good wipe down, give your pots a good wiping and dusting. Um, you know, maybe it's time to buy a better plant stand for that one plant. Maybe it's time to buy a trellis for your vining plant to be able to grow on. All of this type of stuff is supported by this waxing uh, moon in Capricorn. Also on this day, Venus enters Virgo. So we have a lot of Earth sign emphasis happening on this day. Moon moving through Capricorn and Venus entering Virgo at the same time. Venus is going to uh, hang out in Virgo for about a month. So on the day that a planet changes signs and moves into a new sign, we can feel it extra emphasis or we can see it in the world with a lot of extra emphasis. But we have like basically a month to work with this transit. What's up with Venus in Virgo? This is all about finding beauty in the details and the routine. This transit can help shine a light on how you help others and what's missing or flawed in your life in terms of values and money and self-care. Wait a minute, didn't we just talk about that? Yes, we did. You gotta love it when it all lines up. Sometimes it's right to offer our services for free or with no comment or at a super heavy duty discount. And sometimes that becomes martyring ourselves or being taken advantage of, or, you know, people assuming that we're just always going to be there to provide that thing. So this transit is a really fantastic check-in on your standards. Is it time to raise them in particular with how you treat yourself? Virgo wants perfection and refinement. Venus doesn't settle. And in Virgo, Venus wants what is healthy and natural and pure. And pure is a word that can have a lot of toxic baggage with it. So don't get crazy with that because Virgo can. <laughs> this whole transit is a really fantastic time to get your finances together and get your relationships into a healthier space. So that's something that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast as well, right? Speaking truth into situations where things have gotten really, really funky. It's a great time to see exactly what needs to be worked on, especially the places where you are undervaluing yourself. Again, Sometimes selfless service is exactly what we should be doing. And this transit supports that work too. This transit really just supports developing a healthier and clearer relationship and conversation in yourself with these different phases of how do I work with the community? What is that all about? So some of the deep work here is going to look at um, or is going to look a lot like the conversations that we have had about mutual aid in the past. How can you help others and still value yourself? How can you contribute and receive what you are owed and what you need, right? And some of our work in this transit is about making some internal adjustments on how you value yourself and your skills, your time, your energy. And I don't want, okay, listen, Virgo placements, listen to me right now. Look, look me in the eye, okay? I'm talking to you. Do not let this internal dialogue digress into labor equals worth or social value equals worth. There is so much in our world that tells us that we only have worth when we are useful to others. That is so awful because the other way that we say that is we are worthless until someone else decides that we are useful to them or their situation. That is fucking disgusting. Fuck that. That is colonizer shit. We are all worthy of love and support and respect inherently. Period. So, allow this transit Venus will be in Virgo until August 15th. 
And on that day, it's a Scorpio waxing half moon. Yes, that's right. So it's all linking together. Allow this transit to be a time where you discover how integral you are to the world and your community and grow your personal sense of worth, regardless of the adoration or lack thereof from the world. Okay. After all that heavy stuff, <laughs> in the mundane world, Venus and Virgo can express as being really practical and down to earth in our expressions of love, doing detailed work on our aesthetics, and um, Virgo can also really tame the overindulgent vibes of Venus. And Venus definitely makes a couple of Jupiter transits, and so there's definitely some opportunity for overindulgence, and Virgo can kind of pull that back a little bit. Okay, let's look at the holy days of July, where, what is it? 21st. <laughs> let's go. Okay, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, we have a boatload of holy days this week. Um, and I am not going to touch on all of the ones for this day uh, in detail, but briefly, we have Damo's Day, which is a modern pagan holiday recognizing um, the woman, Damo, who was Pythagoras's daughter, founded a school near Beirut. She was a seeress. Pretty cool stuff. Also on this day, we have Witches' Day, also from the modern pagan calendar, um, and this is celebrating the craft as life and practice and religion. Also on this day, we have sacrifices at the Temple of Apollo from our Roman ancestors. Um, this always happened at the end of the Ludi Apollinaires, which are the games of Apollo. We talked about them more last week or in the episode before that. So if you want to know more about the Ludi Apollinaires, you can go check that out. Also on this day, we have the birth of Aten, which I think is really funny. Um, <laughs> um, Ankenaten uh, was a uh, pharaoh in Egypt that basically was like, screw this whole polytheistic thing. We're just going to have one god. And his one god was Aten. And so Ankenaten put the birth of Aten here in the midst of this intercalculatory week where all the other old Egyptian gods are being born. He was like, no, 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 shut up. This is the one. We're just talking about this one. Super cute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the two holidays that I want to talk about in detail um, for this day are... Uh, the birth of Set and Cronia. Okay, so the birth of Set, Egyptian. Again, this is a part of, like I said, the intercalculatory week where all of the big deities of Egypt are being born. Um, Set is also known as Sutek or Swuth or Seth. And yeah, if you listen to that Swuth, Swuth, very similar to Swin, Swain, Swithens, yes. Yes, that is linguistically connected. <laughs> this is a god of the deserts, storm, disorder, violence. Set is the adversary. Many of the great myths um, from Egypt that describe encounters between Set and Horus are these great battles between the two of them. And really it's a, it's a description, a metaphorical description of the battle between life and death. Um, Horus was depicted as the Lord of the black land, AKA soil that was wet and fertilized and ready for growing things. And um, Set was described as the Lord of the red land, AKA the desert, which was dry and inhospitable. Um, so a lot of conflict between these two characters Set is related to the west of the Nile area, which again is the desert. And so he's also called the Lord of the Westerners. He is depicted as an animal or an animal headed human. And nobody is really sure what the animal head is because it has parts from several different animals. But at a later time, Set is depicted with a donkey's head. And <laughs> anybody want the obscure reference of the donkey headed adversary opens the discussion. The donkey headed adversary opens the book. Points to anybody who gets that musical reference because it's obscure. 
All right. Also on this day, we have the Greek festival of Cronia. This was an Athenian festival held in honor of the god Cronus or Kronos. Uh, this was always held in the latter part of July or the first part of August. And ostensibly, this was a festival dedicated to um, the, the, the harvest that has just been completed um, for these folks. Um, you would see uh, the rich and poor all dining together, slaves and the free. Um, people are playing games, eating food, playing music, enjoying themselves. And the freedom from work and social egalitarianism enjoyed on the day represented the conditions of the mythical golden age, which Greeks imagined for their um, Arcadian past, as it were, when Kronos still ruled the world. In the Golden Age, the Earth had spontaneously supported human life, and since labor was unneeded, slavery didn't exist. It was, quote, a period of thorough harmony in which hierarchical, exploitative, and predatory relationships were non-existent. The Cronia was a time for social restraints to be temporarily forgotten. Outside of this, Kronos is not well documented, but Kronos is Saturn, who is set. So, of course, these two holidays are happening on the same day at the same time. Uh, Kronos was usually depicted with a harp, a scythe, or a sickle which was the instrument that he used to castrate and depose Uranus, his father. No big deal, but we do love uh, the death of patriarchies here on the, on the channel. Um, Kronos is synonymous to Kronos, like the word time, for time, since he maintains the course and cycles of seasons and the periods of time. So here we have this character who's pretty well known for being grumpy, stodgy, um, but also a vegetation deity, but also dealing with time and sort of dealing with a, almost a time out of time, this golden age thing, right? Interesting stuff. And that brings us to July 22nd, which is the last day of this lunar week. We still have our gibbous moon hanging out in Capricorn, so we are still doing our Capricornian work on this day. But what else is happening? We have Venus in Virgo, who we just talked about, opposing Jupiter retrograde in Pisces at zero degrees. So what's up with a Venus oppose Jupiter moment? Well, we need to watch the tendencies for excess with this transit. Excess in all things, excess in our optimism, excess in our estimation of what we can handle. Venus opposed Jupiter. Oftentimes we say yes to things that we are not going to be able to follow through on or, um, you know, as the, uh, metaphorically, this is this is a, a an old technical magical term. Writing checks that our asses cannot cash, I believe, is how that works. Um, whatever it is that we are striving to acquire, we will be really, really wanting it <laughs> on this day. And folks who appear abundant with money or beauty or privilege may seem very attractive on this day. So. Overindulgence is normal with this transit. If you can keep your most extreme desires in check and not buy out the entire crystal store, <clears throat> totally not talking about myself, uh, this can be a truly pleasure-filled transit. Even in opposition from Jupiter is going to be cute, or to Jupiter is still going to be cute. It's Jupiter. It's Venus. Come on. Um, so this is not a great day for t getting a ton of work done um, or like making super hardcore serious decisions about things. No, but this is a fantastic time for pleasure, shopping, travel, play, all of that good stuff. Also on this same day, the sun moves into Leo. So we are officially stepping into Lunasa, Lunasad, Lamas season as far as I'm concerned once the sun has moved into Leo. When the sun is in Leo, we all may want a little bit more attention for ourselves. We might want to be seen as leaders or stars in our field. We are blooming and we want to bloom and we want to be admired for our abloom. <laughs> and we may be a little bit more self-centered, but you know what? That's okay sometimes. Again, let's look back on the work that we're doing this week. We are stepping out. We're speaking truth to power. We are reevaluating our worth and our merit and the dope-ass things that we provide 
into community. So yeah, you know what? Let's take a minute to gas ourselves up just a little bit more because I think we need to. <laughs> I think it's good. There's something to always being in the audience, right? We all need to take our turn and be the entertainers for the group. Very, very important stuff. Okay, let's briefly and quickly <laughs> look at the holy days for July 22nd. Originally, she played a limited role in royal rituals and temple rites, although she was more prominent in funeral practices and magical texts. She was usually portrayed in art as a human woman wearing a throne-like hieroglyph on her head. During the New Kingdom, and that's approximately like 1550 BCE, so, you know, three, four thousand years ago, as she took on traits that originally belonged to Hathor, the preeminent goddess of earlier times, Isis was portrayed wearing Hathor's headdress, which is a sun disc between the horns of a cow. So we see Isis as Hathor at some point. Um... Her reputed magical power was greater than that of all the other gods, and she was said to protect the kingdom from its enemies, govern the skies and the natural world, and have power over fate itself. Um, you know, she eventually, because of her um, synchronism to Hathor, took on being a goddess of fertility and motherhood and just, I mean, literally everything, right? Literally everything. Her worship spread across the wider Mediterranean region. Some of her devotees said she encompassed all feminine divine powers in the world. Isis is first mentioned in the Old Kingdom approximately 2700 BCE. So that is nearly 5,000 years ago. The worship of Isis was ended by the rise of Christianity. And if you find pictures of Isis with Horus sitting on her lap, her son Horus, they are identical to pictures of the Virgin Mary holding Christ on her lap. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. What else do we have happening on this day? Well, we have the Feast of Mary Magdalene. Um, before I get into that, though, let me, let me emphasize this. Isis was the sister and the wife of Osiris. So they have sister brother energy, but they also have partnership companion energy. Very important. Now, let me get back to this. The Feast of Mary Magdalene. This is celebrated by Catholics, Christians, and pagans alike. Who was Mary Magdalene? This was the woman who, according to the four canonical gospels, traveled with Jesus as one of his followers and was a witness to his crucifixion after his aftermath, blah, blah, blah. She's mentioned by name 12 times in the canonical gospels, more than almost any other apostle more than any other woman in the gospel other than people in Jesus's direct family. The gospel of Philip presents Mary Magdalene among Jesus's female entourage, adding that she was his koinonos, which is a Greek word variously translated in contemporary versions as partner, associate, comrade, and companion. Let's not forget that um, in the 1950s or 1960s, uh, not the Dead Sea Scrolls, but another finding very similar to that cache of parchments and writings from back in the day, the Gospel of Mary was discovered, wherein Jesus gives her basically the Gnostic cosmology. Kind of a big deal. I wonder why they don't want her chapter included in the book. Um, there's records of the apostles complaining because Jesus would kiss her on the mouth. And, uh, you know, at that time, kissing people was a very normal thing in, in social settings. So lots of people kissed lots of people for lots of different reasons. It wasn't, it didn't have the, the potency that it does today necessarily, but all the same, the apostles were like, why do you kiss her on the mouth? And Jesus was basically like, you know, there's people that can see and there's people that are blind. And that was literally his response. <laughs> But anyways, this is the Feast of Mary Magdalene, who may have been a sister and may have been a companion to Jesus. Also on this day, we have Jaya Parvati Puja from our Hindu friends and neighbors. Um, this is a five-day women's celebration celebrating Jaya as an avatar of Parvati. Who is Parvati? She is the goddess of fertility, love, beauty, harmony, marriage, children, and devotion, um, as well as 
uh, of just divine strength and power. Um, she's known by a ton of names. Jaya, as I said, is an avatar of Parvati, and she is the gentle and nurturing form of this supreme goddess. Um, she's one of the central deities of the goddess-oriented Shakti sect called Shaktism. She is the mother goddess in Hinduism, and this festival uh, is for both unmarried women who are looking for partners and for married women to give prayers for the health and the long life of their partners, all sitting very interestingly with this birth of Isis, the birth of Mary, and of course, thinking back to the relationship between Isis and Osiris, where Isis literally puts Osiris's body back together after he's chopped into pieces by Set um, and, and brings him back to life, <laughs> in a sense. Um, okay, last thing that I want to talk about for this day, from July 22nd through the 27th, we have Mercatus from our Roman ancestors. This is Mercatus number one, there's going to be another one later in the year. The noun Mercatus means commerce or the market, but it also refers to fairs or markets held immediately after certain ludi or games. Established Mercatus in conjunction with religious festivals to uh, basically facilitate trade since people had already gathered in great numbers. So this is literally <laughs> the, the Roman Republic deciding we need people to go buy shit. They just got together, they had their big festival and their celebration. We need to encourage more shopping. So literally <laughs> shopping as social construct <laughs> from our Romans. What else do you expect from those guys? Let me tell you. All right, here's the wrap up for the week. Continuing with our intercalculatory week from our ancient Egyptian friends and ancestors, today is the celebration of the birth of Isis. Um, Isis, if you're not familiar with her, kind of a big deal. <laughs> kind of a big deal in Egyptian pantheon. Isis is believed to help the dead enter the afterlife um, as she helped her husband Osiris. In our lunar phases, we are moving through the waxing half moon in Libra, waxing half slash gibbous in Scorpio, gibbous in Sagittarius and gibbous in Capricorn. Uh, the themes of the holy festivals that we are dealing with this week are pilgrimages, holy processions and celebrations of religious or magical paradigms. Harvest festivals are already beginning. Uh, New year starts or resetting of time is happening now. A uh, big emphasis on lovers, marriage and companion festivals. And of course we can't forget shopping. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, there's also a big celebrations around deities of magic, archetypes of wisdom, warrior deities, deities that do it all and deities of time. And I guess a little bit for deities of the dead as well. Next week, we have our full moon in Aquarius. Mercury enters Leo. Mars enters Virgo. And Jupiter in retrograde goes backwards into Aquarius. Woo! Okay. Um, that's it. That's all I've got for you guys. <laughs> I hope it's enough. I love you. Take care of yourselves. Value yourselves and value what you have to offer the world. Because uh, it starts with you. Blessed be, my heathens. Mwah!